Welcome to the uh, Cyber Conflict and Law of Armed Conflict panel. Um, it's technology. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to the panel because uh, I, I never know what's going to come out of the mouths of the gentlemen on the panel, which is great. And I'm going to do all the introductions first, and then I'll, I'll let them talk. And that'll, since this will probably be the last word I get in, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to uh, use it now. And I had this request from an operator who was here, and really we're, we're trying to cater to the operators as well as the lawyers. So I'm going to take just a second to ask a question, because this was the comment that came up. Why do we never get a straight answer from the lawyers about whether Stuxnet was a use of force or not? Because pe people, a lot of people kind of talk around it, and we see a lot of this in the press. So I would just like to throw this out there as an informal poll. And I'm just going to talk about use of force and unarmed attack, because we're not going to get into that nuance. So uh, obviously, we're just looking at the lower threshold for people who think that there's a difference between the two. But how many people here think Stuxnet constituted a use of force? <laughs> it's only because the Washington Post is not here. <laughs> How many people people think it definitely did not? Okay, but it did not. Okay. Yeah, they're not. Well, okay. Well, I, we have not to say that it's right or wrong, but there's clearly a consensus in the room. So that's I think that's interesting to know, to note. I don't know what we're going to do with it, but I'm sure it'll be critically important. We're going to publish it in the Washington Post. That's what do you it. Think we're going to That's do it. it. Well, she's she's not here, is she? Yeah. Sure. Don't tell her. No. All right. All right. Uh, I'll get started. I'll just do some uh, brief introductions. Really, I think the gentlemen here don't don't need a whole lot of introductions, so I'll uh, I'll keep it brief. I'll start on the on the far end with uh, Charlie Dunlap. Uh, Charlie was uh, retired as a major general from the Air Force in, in 2010 after a distinguished 34-year career. He's uh, yeah. <laughs> See what I meant about getting a word in edgewise? This is <laughs> What's smarter if you push the speaker back? <laughs> I'm done. He's now down at Duke. <laughs> and, and he is he's pretty smart. Uh, now, um, VJ Padmanabhan yes. is uh, an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University Law School. And uh, he's had an interesting career, too, uh, working in international law with a particular focus on human rights, humanitarian law, and international criminal law. He previously taught at the Cardozo School of Law for three years and served in the office of the legal advisor for the U.S. Department of State, which is, which is, is really a fascinating uh, place to work. Uh, Mike Schmidt, a stranger to most of you, I'm sure is uh, chairman of the International Law Department here. And uh, he was previously chair of the public international law, of public international law at Durham University in the UK. And, and before that was at the George C. Marshall European Center uh, for a while. We were there for several years. Yeah, 11 years there. And uh, he obviously he's written a lot, of, uh, a, a lot in this area. Most of us have read um, many of the things that he's written. And, uh, well-published, well-spoken, and we'll just see, I guess we'll see how smart he is uh, as, uh, <laughs> as uh, Professor Schmidt will be uh, up first talking to us about the uh, classification of cyber conflict. Thanks, Gary. Um, I, I need to come out of the closet right up front. I'm in the Wolf uh, Terry School of Thought. Uh, I do not uh, for a second uh, believe that we need a new body of law. The very first step we should do is figure out what the international law is and then apply it to this weapon, just like we would apply it to any new weapon. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, classification of conflict. And this is a very important topic. And it's a very important topic because classification of conflict is the very first step in any LOAC analysis. If you're starting with a LOAC analysis, start here. Ask yourself what type of conflict you're in. Why? Because the type of conflict you're in determines what body of law applies. International or LOAC in its entirety, that portion of LOAC that applies to uh, non-international armed conflicts, or alternatively, human rights law. Now, I always adopt the classic bifurcation. I don't buy this notion of transnational armed conflict or all that other creative stuff. Uh, generated by professors that are desperate to have an original thought so they can get tenure. There are two types of conflict. Uh, 
there's international conflict, international armed conflict, and non-international armed conflict, and there are two types of non-international armed conflict. We will talk about both of them. The analysis I'm going to go through should be the analysis, exactly the analysis you go through in any context. Because when you're looking at cyber operations, it's exactly the same, exactly the same as operations with a Tomahawk cruise missile, uh, a JDAM, or a rock and a stick. It's all the same. Apply the law that already exists, and I think you'll find it serves you well. Let's talk about cyber conflict. What's unique about it in the classification <laughs> of conflict context? There are several things that might appear to be unique. The first is that you can really have dramatic, massive, uh, horrendous consequences without having damage, physical damage to things or injury to people. You have operations which can transcend borders, so you launch an attack and it goes through a server in Switzerland and then Bolivia and then wherever before it hits its target. And individuals or small unorganized groups can have pretty dramatic effects, you know, and that's not the case in kinetic warfare usually. Now, my going in premise, and I'm going to take this off the table right away, is if you're talking about the use of cyber operations during an armed conflict, a kinetic armed conflict, then it's real easy. Apply the law that applies to that kinetic armed conflict. So if we're talking about Afghanistan today, in my view, that's a non-international armed conflict. Apply, apply the law of non-international armed conflict. The classic case is Georgia. There were lots of cyber operations that occurred during operations between Georgia and Russia. That was clearly, uh, unquestionably, an international armed conflict. Those cyber operations would have been governed by the law of international armed conflict. So the only thing I'm concerned with here is the classification of a cyber-only conflict, a conflict in which cyber is the only thing going on. So let's do a basic legal analysis. Two types of conflict. The first is international armed conflict, which has been defined authoritatively in common Article 2 to the 1949 Geneva Conventions, which tell us that an international armed conflict or that that convention applies to an armed conflict between high contracting parties. From this definition, which is accepted as customary law, we get two factual criteria. The first is that there must be an armed conflict that is a legal term of art. Okay, that's not a descriptive term, it's a legal term of art. You must have what is a, legally known as an armed conflict, and then secondly, it is between states, so it's a state-on-state -state conflict. So, let's ask the first question now. Let's further dissect this uh, a bit more. The first question is, is, is it an armed conflict, or what is an armed conflict? Well, the ICRC commentary to both the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols give us a bit of a hint. And basically what they say, the uh, uh, commentary to Common Article 2 and the commentary to the protocol, basically what they say is intensity and duration, they simply don't matter. It doesn't matter how much slaughter, it doesn't matter how long, it's, a con it's when you have hostilities between states. It's not an issue of how much. Now I will tell you that I, this happens to be my view, except for absolute de minimis things. Uh, this happens to be my view, although there are some that would require a, some degree of intensity. But this represents the majority view, excluding, again, truly de minimis, uh, de minimis hostilities. Okay? We're still in the, what is an armed conflict? Well, what is armed in the cyber context? Well, in the cyber context, I argue that uh, armed means any operation that amounts to an attack has a matter of law. Again, attack is a legal term of art. I am using it here in the LOAC sense, in the in bello sense, not in the Article 51 sense. All that stuff we've already talked about, forget that. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. I think you need to look for an attack in the context or in the sense of Article 49 of Additional Protocol 1. This now begs the question of what is an attack pursuant to Article 49, which tells us that it's, uh, uh, there are acts of violence. Well, what do we mean by acts of violence in the cyber context? Because the acts themselves are not violent. It's the consequences that are violent. I believe today it is pretty well accepted that we can look at consequences to determine whether or not something is an attack as a matter of law and thus can qualify it as an armed conflict. Clearly, everyone agrees, death, uh, injury, damage, or destruction qualify. Uh, 
There is a well-known battle uh, between mostly myself and Knut Dorman uh, from the ICRC that has been going on uh, for years. Uh, Knut would take it much further than that. However, there's a process going on, which you may have heard about, called the Talon Manual, supported by the NATO Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. And I think we're sort of coming to resolution that we're both, I see the ICRC rep, Cordial Droga, smiling madly like the Cheshire Cat. Uh, I think we're about to put this uh, debate to rest because I believe that what we will eventually conclude is that the notion of damage includes interference with the functionality of an object, f functionality of an object, that's damage, and so uh, therefore that would qualify as an attack. It does not uh, include uh, denial of service. It does not include temporary interference with the messages being sent to the object, which will generally be a computer or server. It means the thing, it doesn't work. If you have to repair it or if you have to reload the operating system, and uh, my uh, friend Wolf von Heinig, I think, disagree on this, but uh, in my view, if you have to reload the operating system, that means you have to fix it, that means it's damaged, that means it's an attack, that means it's an armed conflict. So I think we're about to put that to rest. Uh, what about Stuxnet? Stuxnet is obviously an operation that would commence an armed conflict if conducted by a state. It would be international. Do I anticipate that the standard will stay here? Well, I'm a Lex Lata guy, not a Lex Ferenda guy. I told you what I think the standard is. I think it may evolve over time as we look at state practice because I think states may treat uh, massive economic attacks or if someone takes control of your critical infrastructure has uh, not an armed attack, that's a different issue, but has armed conflict. Maybe, but uh, again, I'm a Lex Lata guy, let's watch this space, see what happens with regard to states. This is a position taken by our friends in the ICRC uh, in their report to the 31st conference. It's a position with which I agree. Let's watch this space. The other requirement is that the conflict be international. That means state versus state. Uh, this would obviously include actions by the armed forces. It would obviously include actions by organs of the state, such as intelligence agencies. In other words, is it international if these guys are doing it? Yes. However, there are other situations in which a, a conflict may be deemed international. Tadic gives us one. That's where you have private individuals who are working in connection with the military or with other organs of the government to conduct these operations. This classic case would be Gary and Cybercom go out and find some really smart kid to conduct cyber attacks against whatever state is our enemy. That would fall in the, in the scope of the Tadic uh, extension. It would be international, even though the kid did it. Okay? Then you have the situation of states having a relationship with non-state actors. Here again, we look at the Tadic case, and this is very well known in this audience. In Tadic, the court said uh, that you have to look at overall control. If a state is in overall control of a group, uh, in other words, they're participating in the planning, if they're supervising, if they're telling them what to do, then that's sufficient. If the group acts, that's as if the state had acted, and therefore you meet the second criterion, which is that it must be state v. state. It does not require specific orders. That's something different called effective control, which is a test used for a different purpose articulated by Nicaragua. So if a state tells a group, go launch cyber attacks, that's good enough. Go, go generally launch this. Go generally pursue this course of action. It's not enough if they merely provide hardware or software. There is a different standard, and this is often missed. There is a different standard if we're not talking about an organized armed group, but rather we're talking about an individual or a group of individuals that are not organized. And there, for the state to kick in, for you to meet the state v. state criterion, there you have to have specific instructions to conduct a specific attack. Now, we have had an example of something like this. That example is, of course, Estonia in 2007 when a whole bunch of Russians, ethnic Russians in Estonia, Russians in Russia, Russians wherever they might be found, started bombarding Estonia with cyber, uh, cyber, they weren't attacks in the IHL sense, but they were operations. That was not international because you did not have state v. state and you had no sufficient relationship between the state and those individuals. Uh, however, we know this from the hostages case, uh, 
uh, from the ICJ, which is in a slightly different context, but also from Tadic, if a state subsequently approves of those operations and takes steps to further them, and the classic example would be mounting defenses so that you can't strike back at the bad guy group, then that would be, uh, that would be international in nature. Simply tolerating an attack from your territory is not enough to make the conflict international, although I might has hasten to add, it is enough to breach your obligations under international law to police your territory. It may amount to an intervention and so forth, but it doesn't make the conflict international. Okay, phase two. We've gone over one, now let's go over the other type of conflict that is non-international armed conflict. Denied, uh, defined in common article three has basically a conflict which isn't one of those that I just told you about. We look to the ICTY to tell us a bit more. I don't have it up here, but it's the Tadic case. What you want to look for is protracted armed violence between a state and an organized armed group or between two organized armed groups. This is a standard that has been adopted by everyone pretty much. The ICTY, Sierra Leone, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, uh, in the um, uh, ICC case law, limited though it may be, they've adopted it and of course it's found in the statutes. So if you're looking for a non-international armed conflict, you're looking for two things. First, a particular level of intensity. Second, an organized armed group. Okay? So let's look at those. Before we do, a very brief uh, detour, though it's not an important one. Note that there is another form of uh, non-international armed conflict known as an additional protocol two conflict to which some states represented in this room are party. That's a conflict between a state and dissident armed forces or an organized armed group uh, in which the group controls some territory uh, to a certain level of control. You can do a never mind for the purpose of this conference and the reason is we're talking only about cyber only com conflicts. And if a group is only conducting cyber operations, how is it that that group controls territory? You can't control territory with cyber-only operations, so for our purposes, you can forget additional Protocol 2 type conflicts and revert back to common Article 3 conflicts. Again, let's talk about the two criteria. The first is that the group in question be organized. This was addressed in a, by the ICTY in a bunch of cases, not just the one I've got cited here. It means that the group has to have some degree of organization. It can't just be a loose affiliation of individuals. For instance, the hacktivist in the Estonia case. And I would further argue that it's enough where it, they have to be organized enough where they can operate in a coordinated manner, in a coordinated manner. They have to kind of operate as a team. As a practical standard, I've suggested before that what you ought to be looking at is you look at the act and you ask yourself, was that the act of a group? Did the United States Marine Corps do that? Or did George Cadwallader do that? If it's the first one, you've met organization. If it's the second, you have not. Does not include groups acting in concert. That's the Estonia case. And it even doesn't include uh, groups or individuals that are accessing, and this is important because this happened in Georgia, accessing the same website to find targets and to find malware. That's not good enough to be organized, to meet the organized criterion. Well, what about virtual groups, okay? You organize on land, land, uh, or online. You may not know who the other person is because they call themselves slick techs or something like that. You have no idea who they are, but you've somehow organized online to conduct operations. In my view, you can meet the organization criteria because I can certainly see a situation in which even though they don't know each other, they're organized and there's a, a leader, uh, a virtual commander, and the virtual commander orders operations to occur and they coordinate, and they, they mission plan, and they share intelligence. They do all those things that all of you do on a regular basis. There is a problem, though, and the problem with regard to virtual organizations is that the additional or additional protocol two says, includes references to a group which is under responsible command or a group that is organized enough to implement the protocol. And the commentary tells us that means to be able to impose discipline. And so, the, and it's been found customary by the ICTY in a, in a finding that is somewhat questionable. 
Okay, I'm not sure that the court got it right in this case. Um, but, you know, it would be virtually impossible for a virtual group to impose discipline. If Terry Wolf and I are in the same group, but we don't know who, who we are, it's, uh, you know, beer belly and uh, uh, handlebar mustache. I didn't mean anything by that. Uh, beer belly, handlebar mustache, and an extra uh, hot middle-aged guy. If we're all in the same group, how do I impose discipline? Calm down, Captain. Calm down, Captain. Yes. <laughs> how do I impose discipline on <laughs> Jen? I can't continue if you're gonna if you're gonna laugh like this and cry. I can't continue. Okay. How do I impose impose discipline on Terry? I can't. So this is important because if this is a requirement, if this is in fact reflective of customary law, you cannot get there from here with regard to a group that is solely organized online. Second criterion is intensity. Uh, is intensity. This is set forth, or the intensity rule is set forth, criterion is set forth in additional protocol two. It is here, most of us know it by heart. It excludes internal disturbances, riots, isolated and sporadic acts. That, in other words, they're setting a threshold. It's not like international conflict. When you have non-international armed conflict, you gotta have sufficient fighting going on. Otherwise, you simply have a disturbance and it's a police issue and look to your domestic law and human rights law. Although this is an additional protocol too, pretty much everyone accepts this aspect of the protocol as reflective of customary international law. That's certainly the position taken in the ICC statute. It is certainly my position. If you have something that looks like that, you are not in a non-international armed conflict. So. The problem is, is although that gives us some hints, we don't have a bright line test, we don't have a clear uh, threshold. We can look to some case law. I've given you just one case. Uh, there are lots of cases in the ICTY about this. Here are some factors you can look at. But the one thing we can be certain of is that it's a fairly high threshold, okay? It would include uh, acts which only cause some damage or some injury because riots can include a lot of damage and a lot of injury. It would also exclude an act which is highly destructive but occurs only one time or only relatively once in a while it occurs. Those are not included. Uh, the one caveat I would make here is that it need not be continuous, a continuous course of conduct because in cyber you, it's, it's, it's not like if I engage you fighting where we, the fighting carries on for a while. With cyber, I may shoot uh, my target today, and I may shoot that target next week and so forth. If it's a regular course of conduct, I think that would satisfy. So long as it's a regular course of conduct that it occurs at the appropriate level of intensity. Uh, conclusions, international armed conflict, I certainly think international cyber armed conflict is possible. Uh, although attribution, not, not the, the practical aspect of attribution, but the legal aspect of attribution to a state is pretty complex. So if you get into a situation uh, where, um, uh, it, where, the, where it hasn't been launched by the armed forces or the intelligence agencies of another state, then you gotta think real hard about the legal issues. They're not different here than kinetic, but the legal issues are tough in either regime. NIAC, I think uh, you're almost never going to see, despite the comment made this morning uh, during an intervention, I think you'll almost never see this. Uh, you have the problem with regard to the enforcement of LOAC. You have to decide whether or not that's customary or not. You have to decide it is customary before you even get there. I think the intensity <laughs> level is going to be very hard to reach because it's not just the intensity of a single act, it's the intensity of a number of acts that are all related. So I think that's unlikely. And I think that, uh, I believe that these standards are likely to evolve over time. As we start to see what happens, as states become concerned about operations, we'll see them begin to evolve, but you know, we're not making new law here. This is naturally the way international law evolves every day in, uh, in areas other than cyber. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Vijay is up next, and 
He's going to talk to us a little bit about the uh, legal status of various cyber actors. Can you hit the next up. slide? No, they're coming up, I think. Oh, well, there they Yeah, okay. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you to Mike, and thank you to all the conference organizers for inviting me uh, here today to speak on the very specific topic of cyber war actors. Um, and because I want to make sure we can really zero in on this specific question, I'm going to take Mike's presentation as sort of the jumping off point uh, for my remarks, meaning that I'm going to assume that, in fact, we are in a world where there is an ongoing international or non-international armed conflict, so we don't need to address any of the difficult questions that Mike was just wrestling with. Um, and we're going to say that there has, in fact, been a cyber attack that has been launched during the course of that conflict. And so not surprisingly, you have the situation where one of the parties to the conflict is trying to decide whether to target or detain an individual who is believed to be responsible for the cyber attack. And so I'm going to focus on a very specific question, which is what are the rules? How do we figure out whether an individual who is some, somehow involved, and we're going to look at different ways people can be involved with cyber attacks, is subject to targeting or detention? And I'm going to do this using existing law. So I think one of the things that we need to think about, um, I know Mike is very strong in arguing that existing law uh, is sufficient to handle these questions. Um, I would encourage everyone to, t to think about that question critically as I go through these different actors and in fact consider whether this existing category-based approach provides us the kind of guidance uh, that states would need, that operators would need to decide whether to uh, actually respond to a cyber attack. Um, and the other point I want to make up front is that I'm going to be using some very stylized facts to try to develop who these actors are. And so another question you should probably be having in the back of your mind as you listen to my comments is, how would we ever know what this guy's talking about? In other words, the facts that I'm describing are going to be exceedingly difficult to develop, I think, in the context of cyber. Uh, that makes, in some ways, this exercise a bit academic. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the presentation. So as a, oop, went too far here, okay. As a starting point, um, just as a quick matter of review, for, since we're all experts in the room, is the first question that you want to figure out is, is the actor that we're talking about a combatant or a civilian? So on the surface, we know that's a relatively easy question. A combatant is a member of the armed forces of a party to the conflict, and a civilian is everyone else. And so when we're talking about state armed forces, we have a point of reference to decide who's a combatant and who's not a combatant, and that's the local law of the state in question. So we look to US law to answer the question of whether someone who's affiliated with the United States is or is not a member of the armed forces of the United States. Uh, with respect to non-state groups, however, the answer is much more complicated. Uh, we have had about 11 years at this point of legal development on this question as a consequence of the 9-11 attacks and the US conflict with Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. There was a proliferation of definitions of what it means to be a member of a non-state group. Uh, courts have addressed this, scholars have addressed it, the ICRC has. Two of these definitions that I think are particularly interesting or useful one is the ICRC definition, which is that an individual who has a continuous combat function uh, for an organized armed group is going to be considered a combatant. Uh, and we can, we're going to talk as we go through the examples about what that means in practice. The DC District Court, in the course of the habeas litigation that's been going on with respect to Guantanamo Bay, offered a different test that I think is also quite interesting, which looks to see whether an individual is within the command structure of an organization and views that as the test as to whether somebody is or isn't a combatant. And so we can talk about uh, the merits of some of these definitions. So you've got to figure out, is the person a combatant or are they a civilian? And we do that because there's some very important consequences that flow based on the category that you fall in. So if we can figure out which which of these three boxes, if you will, 
that you fall into. I know Mike doesn't like the way I use these categories, but I'm nevertheless going to proceed with them. Um, um, the, the first of these boxes is what we'd call a lawful combatant, what many of you in this room uh, would consider yourselves to be and are. And as a lawful combatant, you would be subject to targeting at any time. You would be subject to detention by the enemy until the end of hostilities. But if captured, you would be entitled to POW privileges and could not be prosecuted for acts consistent with the laws of war. An unlawful combatant is the, faces the same rules for targeting and detention, targeted at any time, can be detained until the end of hostilities, but does not receive POW privileges and does not have combatant immunity. And lastly, we have, of course, a civilian box, uh, which would be where I would be. And for such, so you can target a civilian only for such time as he directly participates in hostilities and we'll spend a good bit of time talking about what uh, DPH means, can be detained only when required for imperative reasons of security, so it's a uh, individualized suspicion standard, uh, but if captured or denied POW privileges and could be subject to prosecution in the local courts. So let's see if I can get to my, okay. So what I'm going to do then is try to figure out how five different actors that we might encounter in this sort of conflict would be categorized using this boxes approach. And so um, I'm going to talk about a US general, a uh, US government contractor, CIA trigger man, an Al Qaeda cyber ops commander, and an American citizen who doesn't have any sort of formal affiliation with Al Qaeda, may have never met anyone from Al Qaeda, but is a sympathizing hacktivist. And so let's start with, everyone should be familiar with him, General Cartwright. So we're going to imagine that General Cartwright has ordered the production and release of a worm that disables Al Qaeda's command and control communications infrastructure. And so how do we go about categorizing him in our three box system? Well, that's the easiest case that we're going to get here. I won't spend too much time on it other than the fact that he's a lawful combatant. He's been designated under US law. Um, he's integrated into the permanent command. In fact, he's the commander. He's making these orders. So from the perspective of the enemy, he's subject to targeting at any time. He's subject to detention until the end of hostilities. But if he's captured, he has the privileges associated with being a prisoner of war, including combatant immunity. So now, of course, he can't make, as we know, General Cartwright, as wonderful as he is, is not going to actually be able to make this worm himself. So he contracts, the US government contracts, with a private software developer to try to create the worm. And so we think about how would we evaluate the legal status of this contractor. And so first question is, is he a, is this contractor a lawful combatant? And the answer to that question is no, because we again look to the domestic law of the United States as a private uh, citizen who's in a contractual relationship with the United States, not part of the armed forces, and therefore he would not be considered to be a lawful combatant. What might he be? Might he be a de facto combatant? And here, I think we need to focus on what it is specifically that this individual is doing, uh, which is that he's developing a weapon for the use by the state. And tradi under traditional doctrine, we wouldn't consider that to be a combatant function, right? It's akin to the person standing in the factory making tanks, right? They're part of the general civilian support uh, that we would associate with the war effort. Um, they're not in the chain of command. They're not engaged in any sort of continuous combat function. And therefore, they're not any sort of de facto combatant. So therefore, we know they're a civilian. But the question becomes, is this a civilian who is directly participating in hostilities? And again, if we look, uh, and we'll look here to the ICRC's DPH study, which I think goes into a good bit of detail on how to evaluate someone of this sort, um, we would say, no, this individual is not directly participating in hostilities. Obviously, the worm is something that is going to do a great deal of damage to the enemy. So you would ask, well, why is that not direct participation? Uh, but the decision has been made, at least by the ICRC, and I think by a lot of folks, to draw the line past uh, 
uh, general wartime support. So creating weapons that are then going to be used by the state is generally not viewed as a direct participation in hostilities. There's going to have to be another intervening actor uh, before the harm is done. So I would say, and of course at the end of this people are free to ask questions because I'm sure some people are going to disagree with each of these characterizations I'm making. Um, I would say he's a civilian. I would say this contractor is your classic civilian, not subject to targeting, uh, subject to detention only for imperative reasons of security, but if captured, not entitled to POW privileges and potentially subject to prosecution. And of course, query whether that rule makes sense because arguably this contractor is more dangerous than even General Cartwright because he actually knows how to, from a cyber perspective anyway, because he's the one that actually knows how to make the worm. All right, so our next actor. So our contractor has made this worm, and he's turned it over to a trigger man at the CIA. And so what the CIA is doing is it's collecting intelligence information about the command and control infrastructure that's used by Al Qaeda, and it's gonna use that intelligence information to figure out the best way to launch the worm and then actually go ahead and launch the worm. So we need to think about how are we going to characterize this trigger man. And so we need to figure out might he be a lawful combatant or might he be an unlawful combatant to start with. And so let's assume to start with that that's, this is the regular job of the CIA official. Right? What he generally does as his day-to-day -day employment is to collect intelligence information and try to launch destructive viruses or worms. I don't know anything about the operational details, so hopefully this example makes some sense. But um, some, some launch this worm to try to take down the communications infrastructure. Well, here the question would be, well, what does this function look like? And I think you'd make the argument it does appear that this individual is engaged in a continuous combat function, right? His general job is to launch attacks against the enemy that are designed to have an effect, passes a threshold of harm, and it's designed to advance the cause of one of the belligerents in the conflict, in this case, the United States. And so the question then becomes, is this person a lawful combatant or an unlawful combatant? Uh, and here, I think an important question, because we know under U.S. law, uh, the CIA is not characterized as combatants. They're not part of the armed forces of the United States. And so we then look to Article 4A2 of the Third Geneva Convention, which lists uh, criteria that other militia that are part of the uh, organized forces, or the exact wording is, members of other militias belonging to a party to the conflict uh, are going to be entitled to POW status. And there you enter into a couple of difficult questions because those criteria require that the individual carry a fixed sign and also carry their arms openly. And it's not clear that the CIA official would in fact meet these requirements. And again here it's worth asking yourself why that would matter at all because of course uh, the person who's launching a worm is going to be in an office somewhere, presumably here in the United States, whether he's wearing a uniform or carrying his arms openly, whatever that might mean. Um, why that matters for, in terms of legal status is unclear, but following the traditional rules it would. And so you would probably end up with the conclusion that if the general job of this trigger man is to launch these viruses to bring down the communications infrastructure, that he's in fact an unlawful combatant. And, for those of us that remember Gary Solis's piece, of course, in the Washington Post, talking about the drones issue, it's a somewhat similar analysis to what, what he used in his piece. Now, on the other hand, you could also imagine that the trigger man is doing this as a one-off, that normally he just collects intelligence information, but there's this really special worm that has been created by our operator, by our um, private contractor, and so, He's a regularly a civilian, not engaged in a continuous combat function, but the question becomes, is he directly participating in hostilities by virtue of launching the worm? And I think there is really, it would be very difficult for me to conclude that he's not. Um, there is, if the goal is to bring down the communications infrastructure of the enemy, it seems that it passes the threshold of harm. It's a 
a potentially grave assault on the infrastructure of the enemy. There's a direct link between the worm and the damage, and it's done to advance the war cause of the United States. And so he'd be a civilian who's DPHing, meaning that the enemy could target him for such time as the participation is ongoing, although query what that means in terms of launching a worm, um, but would also be subject, uh, if captured, uh, could be detained if uh, in reasons of security so demanded, and also would be subject potentially to prosecution for being involved in those activities. All right, so those are our people. Let's think about the enemy a little bit. So Al-Qaeda, in this stylized example, is more of a sophisticated organization than they are in practice. And so they actually have a cyber commander who's not happy about this worm that the United States has launched, and so decides to respond with their own computer program that's designed to crash a portion of our electric grid. And so we're going to think about how are we going to qualify this cyber ops commander? Well, he's certainly not a lawful combatant because Al Qaeda has no legal authority to be using force under international law, so can't categorize him as a lawful combatant. But I think he's pretty clearly an unlawful combatant because he has a continuous job of trying to launch these cyber operations that would meet the direct participation test. Another way of thinking about it that I offered earlier, the DC District Court approach, you would think about him, I think, as in the command uh, structure of Al Qaeda and therefore uh, an unlawful combatant under that test as well. So he's kind of a, a kind of like General Cartwright, an easy example of who to classify. Here's a much harder one, which is the Al Qaeda sympathizing hacktivist. Um, so let's assume that Al-Qaeda's attack fails. But there's an American teenager who's never met with anyone from Al-Qaeda, has no connections with Al-Qaeda of any sort, except that he visits jihadi websites and sympathizes with the aims of the organization. So he decides, well, I'm a lot smarter than this Al-Qaeda militant. I'm just going to create my own worm. And he succeeds in crashing a portion of the American electrical grid. So how do we think about him under this category approach? Well, he's certainly not a lawful combatant, right? Um, he's not authorized by any state to be engaging in combat activity. And I think equally clearly, his one-off action in support of Al-Qaeda does not make him an unlawful combatant. He's not in any sort of continuous combat function. He's a teenager going to school in the United States. He's also not within the command structure of the organization. He chose to enter into this on his own. So I think classifying him as an unlawful combatant would be difficult to do. And so instead, I think we would probably conclude that he was a civilian who's directly participating in hostilities, right? He's someone who has launched a serious attack. It's brought down a portion of our electric grid. Um, he has done it for the purpose of advan his, his worm was responsible for doing it, and he's done it for the purpose of advancing the cause of Al Qaeda, who's one of the belligerents in the conflict. And of course, then that raises the question: If in fact you could reach the conclusion that he's a civilian who's directly participating in hostilities, would you want to? In other words, would you want to invoke IHL um, as the as the modality for dealing with this kind of individual? Or is he better thought of as a cyber criminal who we would handle consistently with our domestic laws? So let's ask some, what I think are some difficult questions that hopefully emerge from what was a rather rapid march through these characters. The first is, and I think this is a very operational question uh, that maybe some people in the room are interested in, which is how should the United States use non-military personnel in, as part of our cyber operations, our offensive cyber operations. And I think uh, there's an argument that's been made by a lot of scholars and some operators that we need the technical expertise of individuals outside the armed forces in order to be effective in the cyber world. But the danger in employing them in particular functions is that you may be using civilians in combat. Now, uh, Michael will say that's not illegal per se, 
but it might have some drastic consequences for the individual. Specifically, if they were captured in some way, they would not be entitled to POW privileges and could be subject to prosecution. And would we in the United States feel comfortable with employing our personnel in this manner, putting them at that kind of risk? Second question, and I have a specific version of it, and there's a more general question behind it. I asked the question in the presentation, is IHL the best body of law to handle hacktivists? And there's a broader question to this, which is, does this category approach that I've been just marching through for you, does it really work? You know, do we think that the categories, as they're applied to these different cyber actors, produce the results that we want? In other words, does it make sense that we have a system whereby we might be able to target the hacktivist, the kid, who is directly participating in hostilities by launching the worm, but on the other hand, um, you know, not have, or the enemy not have the ability to target a government contractor who's making the worm, who I think by all accounts is significantly more dangerous than the teenager, or maybe more significantly more dangerous than the teenager. And so, if these categories that were clearly created for a very different time don't work, we might have a unique opportunity now, as the law is not firmly settled in this area, to think about what some alternative approaches to that might be, and I'm happy to discuss some of my ideas about that uh, in the, in the Q&A. And then lastly, um, as I said at the outset, the facts that I was using to try to develop these different characters, these different five actors, were fairly detailed, right? I knew what each of these people were doing. But query how a state is ever going to develop the answers to these questions. How are you ever going to know before you use kinetic force to target someone who's involved in launching one of these attacks, or even with respect to detention of somebody that you've captured, how are you going to figure out what their involvement was with a cyber attack? And I think the attribution problems raise, uh, raise questions about the previous question, right? Which is that if our ability to categorize people turns on developing factual information that's going to be very hard to develop, do we really think that this category approach is going to provide us the results we're looking for. So I will stop there because I think I'm probably over my time and turn it over to Charles. All right. Uh, thanks very much. Charlie's now going to talk uh, some about command responsibility, which is a unique uh, issue in uh, cyber. And I also hope will uh, give us a few words on the proper role of lawyers in cyber operations as well. Thank you very much, Gary. And uh, folks are going to be uh, very disappointed to know that I only have two slides. And uh, I know how much late in the day people would prefer a longer slide presentation. But uh, I'm very anxious to get to the Q&A, actually, BJ, because you said some things that lifted me out of my chair oh, a little boy. bit. Um, we all. I'm not going to go through the whole law of command responsibility, uh, although I must tell you that when I started to prepare for this, I thought I knew this area of the law pretty well. But uh, as you work through the cases, it's, it's a little bit more complex than I thought. I am of the school that believes that existing law can be applied to cyber war, cyber operations. And I'll, I'll call myself in the Anna Alexandra Purina school that seems to believe that. And I also think that we need to be very cautious about trying to, the time may not be right. I think the U.S. government may be correct to try to uh, come to resolutions even in this area of command responsibility. And I'm also going to presuppose that we're in some kind of armed conflict because while there are forms of command responsibility that are applicable it outside of the armed conflict, and I am going to talk about those, uh, at least let's get down the basics. Uh, there's a good book out that's just come out by one of our colleagues here, Eric Jensen, Jeff Korn, Vic Hansen, and, and a few others, that has kind of uh, talked about the evolution of the law since the Yamashita case. As you probably know, the meaning of the Yamashita case is uh, People have different opinions about it. There are pe people who will tell you it stands for strict liability. If you're the commander, somebody, something bad happens, you're responsible. But when you actually look at the holding of the case or the, what the military commission found, they really concluded that Yamashita actually knew what was going on. 
It wasn't just the fact that he was the commander of the 14th Army, 14th Japanese Army Group, when 8,000 uh, Filipinos uh, were murdered by troops under his command. And so the extent to which that is a well understood president is, I think, disputed. Uh, in Jeff's, Jeff Korn's book and Eric Jensen's book, they, they kind of summarize the law as it is has as it has evolved because we have different pieces of international law that play in here we have the icty statutes we have the statutes for rwanda and uh, former yugoslavia we have the additional protocol and a couple of the articles speak about command responsibility and trying to distill down those elements i think this is a pretty good um, a pretty good summary and when we talk about the necessity to have command responsibility. And command responsibility, technically speaking, command responsibility talks about the commander's obligation to issue lawful orders. Respondiat superior is actually the commander's responsibility for what troops under his or her command do. The command relationship between the superior and subordinate, this actually relates, I think the issue, and I'll just try to focus on the issues that relate to cyber, is how does this work really when you have a cyber operation that's conducted by people who are not members of the armed forces who the commander cannot command and what is customary international law versus what uh, my friend bill boothby corrected me on this uh, the statute of the icty because there are it it could be possible that cyber operations would be executed by a mishmash of uniform military people, contractors, uh, civilians who are members of the intelligence agency. And from a strictly military perspective, a military commander cannot uh, command those people, cannot punish them. And the issue then becomes, do they have effective control? And I think it's interesting when you look at the recent uh, Charles Taylor case um, for the Special Corps for Sierra Leone. And one of the things he, one of the few things he was acquitted of was command responsibility, because what the court found is that uh, although they, it, it said it must be demonstrated that the superior had effective command and control over the subordinates. That is the material ability to prevent or punish commission, the commission of the offense. And the court found that although Taylor had substantial influence over the leadership of the various culpable organizations, substantial influence over the conduct of others fell short of effective command and control. So when we heard earlier in this conference about the realignment of, of command and control that is extremely important if we're going to talk about command responsibility because it's really going to have to be very clear cut and we're, there's going to have to be some sort of demonstration that there is effective control over civilians and especially contractors and under, mil, under U.S. law, uh, a commander, only a uniform commander can command other uniform people and uniform commanders cannot command civilians and they certainly cannot command contractors. Whether or not they can nevertheless affect, uh, have effective control, I think depends upon the exact relationship that's set up within the cyber organization. Uh, and in, I think that uh, the other issue, the next issue that we want to look at very quickly is the information or knowledge that triggers the commander's duty to act. If you look back through the cases, uh, especially a lot of the discussion in the Yamashita case, it, it talks about a standard of should have known or, uh, and that really is not the standard. The standard today really requires some degree of actual knowledge. And this raises another issue that's been uh, talked, to, talked around here at the conference. To what degree does the executing commander need to understand what he or she is doing? And I would suggest that if you're going to talk about command responsibility, and indeed the responsibility of the commander to uh, affirmatively understand what's going to be happening, 
that relates to this element. I think it's a very important element to keep in mind. Uh, and the duty of act, to act is triggered when the commander come, you know, gets some information that indicates that there may be a violation of the law of war. Well, what does that mean exactly? I think it may mean that the commander, uh, the origin, if the commander is the originating commander, that's one tasking. If the commander is just one who's passing through the orders, then the standard is a little bit different. And if you go back and look at the Cali case, remember in the Cali case, his defense was uh, Medina, uh, Captain Medina had ordered him to kill civilians and he was just passing it through. And when you look at the holding in the, in the Cali case, it talks about that. And generally speaking, subordinates, uh, and there's some different differing international law cases on this, but the subordinates who are passing through the order do not have to, they can assume the legality of the order unless it's patently illegal. I think to determine if the order is patently illegal would be particularly hard in a cyber operation because whether or not people really understand what the, what the effects are and so forth, I think is going to be very, very challenging. So the, the officer or the commander who's passing through the, uh, the order to conduct a cyber operation uh, may be very difficult to prosecute under a theory of command responsibility. There are, however, lots of other forms of holding commanders responsible under the Uniform Code of Military Justice outside of the international law context. And before I leave that, I do want to mention, as, as Bill pointed out, and the ICTY statute, they have constructed a form of command responsibility when the person issuing the order is a civilian. And it goes back to, does this person have effective control over the persons who would be committing the, the war crime? Or, and would they have knowledge or some reason to believe that there would be this risk of the commission of the war crime? I see, yeah, I'm sorry, ICC. The Rome Statute, correct. Thank you. Correct. Under the UCMJ, there's a number of ways that commanders can be held accountable for things that happen for war crimes and so forth. And in the U.S. military, these would be prosecuted not likely under Article 18 as a law of war violation, but more as a traditional uh, standard criminal act of like murder or, or what it, whatever it may be. There's other forms of culpability, the law of principles and so forth, and aiders and abettors. But there's also dereliction of duty, and in particular, uh, there's negligent homicide. And in the U.S. military, uh, there's a form of homicide which just requires simple negligence. And the case of U.S. v. Kick explains why that is. It's because the U.S. military has to handle these very dangerous instrumentalities. I think that that is of some cognizance when we start talking about cyber be, and, and the fact that simple ne negligence will carry uh, a criminal penalty in a way that you seldom see in civilian jurisdictions. There's also, I think, a, another interesting uh, offense under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, and that's Article 99, which is misbehavior before the enemy. And this imposes criminal culpability for endangering the safety of a command unit, place, ship, military property, or so forth. And this would seem to criminalize conduct which, um, if a commander fails to secure his command against a cyber attack, and when you start looking at some of the definitions, for example, the definition of what is the enemy within the meaning of Article 99, they talk about, quote, any hostile body that our forces are opposing. And so it can be a mob, it can be anything. In addition, what does it mean to be before the enemy? And that's a question that the manual says is, is a tactical question is a tactical relationship and not one per se of distance. Now, I will tell you, 
I've never heard of a case where it was applied to a commander who failed to secure his command against a cyber attack. But conceptually, it would seem to be there. And when you look at the testimony of General Alexander uh, before Congress last March, he talked about Cy Cyber Command was actively directing the operation of DOD networks, but he also said the, commander, the command was making commanders accountable for their security. And so one would think that in some way they, he has looked or his erudite staff has looked at ways of, of holding commanders accountable for failure to do that. I do think that there are a number of really tough questions, issues that are facing commanders in the cyber realm that, could, that will uh, play upon their accountability and responsibility in these operations. BJ has touched on one of them, and that is the role of civilians in the operations. I, I differ with you a little bit. I, I choose to characterize them as unprivileged belligerents. I don't think they're violating the law of war. I do think that if they're continuously, on behalf of the state, engaged in computer attacks, and I think if you go to the ICRC website, for DPH and you look at the frequently asked questions, it uses computer network attack as an example of, a, of an act that a civilian could do that would be indicative of direct participation in hostilities. I would suggest that if a civilian is continuously in that, you know, in that business, that they would be targetable at any time or any place, which raises uh, the question, I think the responsibility, the ethical responsibility of commanders to make sure that those civilians understand that they can be targeted anytime, anywhere, to include in their home in the midst of their families. And the adversary would have to, a sleeper cell or whatever it was, uh, would have to make the determination, if it chose to abide by the law of war, whether um, you know attacking them there and whatever collateral damage might result uh, was proportional. There's an interesting article in the June issue of Atlantic Magazine, and this relates to something Paul Walker talked about very early in our conference. The, the title of the article is, Can Cyber War Be Ethical? And, and it talks about just war theory and so forth, and the issue that they, ra that they raise, and Paul had raised this to me uh, a couple months ago at a conference at Annapolis, which was on ethical aspects of cyber war, where it talks about attribution in a different way. Does the attacker have an obligation to be identify himself? You know, when I first heard that, I said, absolutely, positively not. That's crazy, you know, maybe perfidy or something like this. But in this article, it says, um, Problem cyber war, easy to mass identity combatants. The counterattack risks hurting innocent victims if the responsible party is unknown. For example, the lack of attribution of Stuxnet raises ethical concerns because it denied Iran the ability to counterattack, encouraging it towards ever more extreme behavior. Well, there's about 6,000 things wrong with that statement, but it does raise the interesting thought that if you conduct a cyber operation where it appears to be coming from a non-involved third party, Austria, for example, uh, is that perfidious in some way in the cyber world because it makes it look like a civilian non-belligerent is conducting the attack, it's being masked by that use? I don't know the answer to that, but I think that we need to start thinking about it. And I would invite your attention to, to that article in Atlantic Magazine, because there's other, other things in there. Let me, uh, let me just speak a few things about, I think, challenges for legal advisors in cyber warfare. And this is, gets to what, um, you know, uh, the little debate that Stuart Baker and I are having in the ABA ABA book that's coming out. Uh, and I don't want to characterize Stewart's argument too much, except to say that he really believes that cyber war has been too over lawyerized and that lawyers are, I think at one point he says, preventing the U.S. from even planning to conduct 
cyber war. I don't think that's true, uh, based on what we, we've read in the newspapers anyway. But the point that I'm trying, that I tried to make in my counter is that I will agree that over-lawyerizing anything is not, a, is not a good, but a lot of the things that I think um, Stuart was concerned about were really policy issues that need to be decided by policymakers. The other thing, the issue of attribution, is that really a lawyer's problem? Or is that a problem for the technologist and the scientist to figure out? Because I think anybody, any reasonable person, is going to want to know who your attacker was before you respond. So yeah, it's a legal requirement, and lawyers will raise that. But it's certainly not something that we should, um, we should cast aside. I do think that one of the challenges here is the technical knowledge. You know, to be an effective counsel, you have to be competent, which means in this instance, you have to know the client's business. And it requires a whole, no, whole nother, other level of knowledge and technical competence in which to provide the right kind of advice. I know I, I don't have it, but I, I believe that those who are choosing to practice in this area really do need to focus on that. The second thing, and I often talk to young lawyers about the famous quote from Winston Churchill that in every person's life, uh, there's the opportunity to do something great that really fits with their talent. And then he says, it's a shame if when that moment comes, they're unprepared to do it. And I think that speaks volumes about anybody involved in operational law, but particularly with respect to cyber. And finally, I want to comment a little bit about some stuff that Jack Goldsmith mentioned. You know, he talked about the idea that, you know, legal advice caused, you know, lawyers have given legal advice that has kind of short-circuited the discussion, and then people take that as a green light, and they go on, and they, it's, they don't think strategically, and the lawyers don't think strategically. And I think that part of that is that lawyers are always being told to stay in their box. Well, I would just invite your attention, at least the U.S. lawyers here, to the Rules for Professional Responsibility, specifically 2.1, which is the role of the lawyer as the counselor. And it talks about that lawyers have to ex can exercise uh, independent professional judgment and render candid advice. But it goes on, I think, importantly to say that in rendering advice, a lawyer may refer not only to the law, but to other considerations such as the moral, economic, social, and political factors that may be relevant to the client's situation. To be sure, the lawyer has to separate that part of the advice from the rest of it. But I can tell you, you know, in the last, I'd say the last 10 years of my active duty career when I was working mainly with three stars and four stars, I can't tell you that I worked in cyber operations, per se, but um, just generally with very senior officers. I would say that 40 to 50 percent of the time when they called me in for advice, it wasn't really a legal matter. I think that what we're seeing is a lot of senior people like to tap into the different way that lawyers think. You know, lawyers undergo a, a training where you learn deductive reasoning, you don't read the newspaper like everybody else because you've had evidence and you know how to weigh data. And you, you do it almost intuitively. You don't even realize you're, you're doing this. You learn to break down problems into elements. I mean, sometimes I find myself even talking that way. I'll say, well, A and B and C. And that's, damn law school did that to me. But the fact of the matter is, that is a very helpful Way, different way of looking at a problem. And commanders and senior leaders and in and out of government are finding that that different way of thinking is a valuable input to have for them. Because they often count, I think, on lawyers, that candor that we render. It's counterintuitive to the basic way military organizations work. If you're a military officer, you're basically a can-do kind of person. And lawyers, Military lawyers are too, and civilian lawyers in, in government practice are as well. But 
lawyers are much more sensitive to being to having the responsibility to tell the client what the client needs to hear versus necessarily what they want to hear. This is not to suggest that we shouldn't aggressively look for inventive ways to achieve uh, the end, but I do think that it it renders the kind of advice that lawyers kind of value that lawyers can add to the cyber discussion is a little bit different and, and more valuable. So I disagree with my, with my friend Stuart. I agree with them that we shouldn't over lawyerize. We shouldn't uh, have lawyers rendering opinions about things when the lawyer doesn't really fully understand the context or the, or the, or the, uh, the client's business, so to speak. But to cast aside the law, particularly in the cyber realm where it's so dependent on the um, on the cooperation of coalition partners would be a huge mistake and um, I'm glad to address any more of that in the q and if you like. Thanks Charlie. Uh, we're going to take questions from the audience but before uh, before I get to those I'm going to give uh, Mike a chance to re-attack on a point briefly or do you? Yeah I'm just going to let you go first since you're ready. Well I, be before we open it up to the audience um, thought we would beat each other up because that'll be much more entertaining for you than from the audience. Uh, first of all, Charlie, I, I want to pray that I misunderstood what you said, that you said that a commander may have some ethical obligation to place a lawful target on notice that he or she may be endangering the civilian population. Well, what I said was that's what the article raised, and I think it's worth thinking about because as you know under the law you know you're supposed to give warnings and so forth you give when warnings practical. to the civilian population when, not to your targets oh well what they're talking about what they're raising is the idea that if you if you conduct an operation where it appears it may where attribution can't be ascertained it's like Having an army that doesn't wear the identifying, you know, symbols visible from a distance or, or whatever it may be. It's raising those same kinds of issues when a cyber attack, which is impossible to, uh, you know, attribute. I haven't, I, I can't tell you I've thought it all through, but it, it's, I've gone from di dismissing it out of hand to thinking, wait a second, there may be something there that maybe there, there is something when you talk about the ends of IHL where you don't want people guessing or assuming that the cyber attack is coming. Yeah. I, I guess my point would be I may have the same trouble, but the law is pretty well settled. Uh, with regard to warnings, warnings only apply to warning the potential victims of an attack. And with regard to distinguishing yourself, the law has long been that ruses are permissible, uh, that it's in fact not a violation of the law of war to wear for civilian clothing, but then you uh, become a, um, you lose your uh, combatant immunity and your right to POW status. And I think the situation that you were talking about in the Austria raises the issue of, of shielding, not an issue of distinction. Well, so, if, if, you, if you conduct an operation where the, the approach or the methodology employed appears to be a civilian vector, does that raise a question? Are you, is that perfidious in some way? I'm not sure I know the answer, but I'm no longer dismissing it out of hand. It is certainly perfidious. It is certainly not perfidy. And the war crime is perfidy and requires uh, perfidious conduct in, in connection with uh, an intent to kill, uh, wound, or if you're a protocol party, capture. Right. This is, but anyways, I mean, we could talk about that. What I really wanted to respond to was VJ. Okay, uh, all right. <laughs> it's just, Charlie, we always agree, and you just caught me by, he trained me at the JAG school years ago, oh. so I thought, what's happened? Uh, he went I'm down not to North that. Carolina. I'm not and, taking that hit. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, what I really wanted to talk about was, Vijay, because I, I wanted to give an alternative viewpoint, and it's a viewpoint that I think uh, is more conventional, because I was concerned, Vijay, with a little bit of your discussion of continuous combat function and your use of the term 
unlawful combatants has distinct from civilians. And so let me give an alternative point of view, and then you can comment or the audience can comment. I think you have to very clearly distinguish between uh, characterization for the sake of targeting and characterization for the sake of detention or other uh, activities. With regard to targeting, there are two categories of people. There are members of the armed forces and there are civilians. Forget combatants. Don't use that term. There are members of the armed forces and there are civilians. The members of the armed forces are divided up into two groups. Members of the regular armed forces and militia, your classic 4A type individual, and members of an organized armed group. With regard to the members of an organized armed group, there is an argument uh, set forth in the DPH guidance that you have to distinguish between those who have a continuous combat function and those who are do not. That's the only place continuous combat function comes up with respect not to individuals, but to members of an organized armed group. For the ICRC, if you have a continuous combat function, you are a member of the armed forces, you are a target. If you do not, you then revert to the civilian status. I don't agree with this. Uh, we've all written on this. I don't agree, but that's, that's how it plays out. Civilians. Who are civilians? Only those individuals who are not members of the armed forces. So they may not be members of organized armed groups or a by the ICRC view, members of organized armed groups with a continuous combat function. They're unaffiliated people. They're people that you hire to put an IED in the ground or people that, uh, like the hacktivists, that just shoot electrons. That's targeting. It's very clear. Now, if we want to talk about combatancy, combatancy is about two issues, POW status and combatant immunity, and that's it. There are two, perhaps three categories. You have combatants. They are the people set forth in the Hague regulations, but uh, set forth uh, more recently in uh, GC4 or GC3 Article 4A. Then there are civilians, there are the other people. Where the term unlawful combatants comes in is to refer to those individuals who are not, uh, do not qualify under Article 4, but nevertheless are fighting. And there are two categories. And the two categories are people who are DPHing and members of organized armed groups. The reason we have this debate has nothing to do with immunity, because everyone agrees they don't have immunity. It has to do with treatment under detention, because the ICRC argues, and by the way, I happen to agree with the ICRC, that there are only two categories, combatants and civilians. Others, prominently, uh, one of my mentors, Joram Dinstein, in his book, have argued that there are three categories, lawful combatants, unlawful combatants, not referring to the group you've talked to, but just referring to this group, and then civilians. Why does it make a difference? Because if you take the Schmidt view, which the ICRC will soon be calling it, uh, <laughs> there is no gap between GC3 protection and GC4 protection. You either get three or you get four. If you take the uh, Dinstinian approach, then there is an issue with regard to the uh, treatment that an individual gets. So. I, I saw your, your pitch, and, but I'm worried because that exact pitch was made as we started the DPH process because a number of us were here, and this was exactly the argument that was made. And uh, you can say what you like about the DPH study, but the one major advance has been to solve that by the admission on the part of the ICRC, to their credit, of the notion that armed forces will extend to cover these people for the purposes of targeting. So the reason I spiked is I, I feel like deja vu. I'm not in 1999 anymore, but I'm back uh, with Niels Meltzer at the start of the DPH guidance. But it's just a light so, comment so, on yeah, what you had to say. <laughs> just two things. One is that one is that I actually don't, after listening to all that, I'm not really sure where we disagree in so far as okay, when you actually, if you actually put out, put, put, together the different boxes and what it works out. You might disagree with the, with the labels that are attached to the category. The are well, but I don't, I, <laughs> and so this gets to, this gets to, but functionally they're not, right? Like, so we both agree that whether, what, what you want to call it a, you know, a, a lawful combatant who's subject, you know, combatant or civilian combatants are subject to targeting, or you say lawful combatant, unlawful combatants are subject to targeting, but civilians aren't. Functionally, we end up in exactly the same spot, which takes me to point two, which is that it shocks me, or not shocks is the wrong word, but it surprises me oh. that, 
No, I don't say appall, but it's just interesting to me the extent to which you are so emotionally committed to the clarity of these categories. When the reality, I think, for anyone that has been operating in this world since 9-11 since is that there's an appalling lack of clarity with respect to these different categories. So I appreciate that you have a very strong and some, you know, a very strong and emotional attachment to the existing system as you interpret it. But I think that, I think that there, I think that there is, I think that that, this exact exchange points out some of the failings of the existing system, which is that, you know, without taking a step back and trying to think about what is it that we want the law to be doing with respect to different groups of people and the threat they pose, we get into semantic discussions about whether we call groups of people um, combat, lawful combatant or unlawful combatant or just combatant and civilian, and we're talking about targeting and tension. When I think functionally, if you looked at that chart, I'm not sure where you would point to on that chart and say we would have a functional disagreement about how it would come out. All right. Please uh, join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>